Anyhow, obviously I didn't like this, this figure draft at all, but you know, there's some basics like label your axes. And I can see what the two columns are, that's good. But I really can't see what the rows are. I guess this is, it looks like an axis label, it says 50 kilometers, but then there's a scale of zero to 30. So is that kilometers? Anyhow, I didn't like this, this figure. Here's another common failing. This is probably done in Excel. And can you tell, here's 50 kilometers. Which of these lines is the 50 kilometer line? Mm -mm. Is it in huh? Well, as Kate said, frequently people print in black and white. So anything you do in color should be maintaining in mind that it might be seen in black and white. Okay? Even though it's blown up, there's like dotted and dashed lines that you can't Yeah, I mean, here you can see that there are different line patterns. But you can use different thicknesses, you can use different colors or shades of gray. You can use different interruption patterns, but these are not distinguishable. <coughs> no. So, in terms of the format, which is to say, where do you have the figures in your manuscript? Now, you're thinking that figure one goes here at the end of the methods and figure two goes here in the third paragraph of the results and you're thinking about how you want this to look when it's published and so you're trying to put those figures in the text but what the publisher wants is for there to be a section figure legends this is at the end and generally they, these pages are not numbered but you have this section of figure legends, and there's the massive caption for that figure, and here's the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then after the figure legends, one figure per page, one, two, three, okay? Now why is that? If the journal is still, let's say, typesetting, they handle images differently than they handle text. And so they're going to fix up that image, get it ready, fix up the text, get it ready, and then at the end they take the figure and place it. Okay? But they don't want you to place it. They're going to place it. Um, and <coughs> even if we're talking about a completely electronic journal that essentially doesn't typeset, so like the PLOS journals. Even they are handling the images separately and then they put in essentially markers in the text that refer out to the figures. So always, always figures go at the end of the manuscript. There is a figure legends with just a sequential figure one and its caption, figure two and its caption, on and on. And then one figure per page. Okay? Good thing is I don't have to go into detail on this. Um, just some general comments and then Arturo can go into the specifics. Uh, color is a very powerful tool with the for the human eye when it's used properly. Um, it's often used very, very poorly. Um, this might be a bit of a dated statement, um, but I certainly, for a number of year, years, would use color for review, but then I didn't have the money to pay for color publication, and so I would substitute in black and white figures for publication. That's less and less of a concern because more and more journals are electronic, and so people are seeing the color version. They may print in black and white, so you have to remember that your figure has to be interpretable in black and white. So many times what we will do 
is prepare the, cover, the figure in full color, but then print it in black and white and see if all the information is still there. Okay? So here's a very good example um, from a recent paper out of KU. Um, did some really nice things here. Um, we're assumed to know that this is um, the Philippines, but the whole paper is about the Philippines. And I really like these white outlined symbols, okay? And I can see circles, I can see triangles, I can see a square, I can see an octagon. So I assume those are all occurrences, right? Robsonius rabori is this one. Robsonius thompsoni, which was the species new to science, is this one. And Robsonius sorsogonensis is this one. And then this species, uh-oh, that's the capital city. Hmm. That kind of, you know, to Moses back in the back of the room, that either looks like one of the circles or it looks like a fourth species known from only a big bustling Southeast Asian city. Okay? But there's some very good things about this figure. This lowland to highland ramp is, is quite attractive. Um, the labeling, maybe the, word, maybe the labeling is a little bit big, especially like here, but in general it's quite nice. Got in latitude and longitude uh, labeling and the north arrow without it being kind of eating up half the space. So in general I like this figure. I really dislike that. What's the other problem, which Arturo is going to talk about quite a bit more? The shading is the predicted distribution of the species we were talking about. But one in 10 people is going to see that green shading as gray. So some of you, one or two of you, are probably seeing that as that. I'm mildly colorblind, but I didn't appreciate it until my wife was asking me questions about shades of lipstick. And she was like, do you like this one or this one? And I couldn't see a difference. And so I got myself tested, and I'm, I'm mildly colorblind. Maybe that's why I focus on this point so much. But do you see here, the predicted distribution of the species, this green area, looks like a highland area. So not only was green used, but green was used in combination with grays. And so it's a fatal trap. So just to mention this, which I'm suspecting Arturo will as well, um, there's a very nice um, platform for choosing color palettes. Uh, it's called Color Brewer. And my understanding is that the inventor of this site is a University of Kansas graduate. Um, anyhow, this is a very useful site. But I'm going to start, stop talking right now and pass you on to Arturo, who will give you some more in-depth thinking about color. Uh, is it a rule that in, in uh, published papers, figures should be below and uh, the, 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 the figures caption should be below and the table be, be at the top? I'm saying this because in one of the manuscripts that you projected, the figure was above. So I, I think different journals will have their own styles, per, per, particularly as uh, more and more journals go electronic. Um, but in the published versions, uh, yeah, certainly general, almost always the table has its header at the top. 
Um, I'm thinking figures most of the time, yes, the captions below. I don't think there are any hard and fast rules anymore. Okay? Yes? Did you say when the paper is cited, many times it measures its quality? So the question is whether citation is a measure of quality. Certainly it is. It, there are many measures of quality. Okay, um, For example, one measure of quality is the quality of the journal that it is published in. And that's the impact factor idea. But as I said, you know, even in science and nature, there are some really bad papers right, that have zero impact on the field. Um, so a lot of people are thinking that the journal impact factor is a poor measure of the paper's impact. Or put another way, the journals where a scholar publishes are a poor measure of, where, of how good or bad he or she is as a scholar. Okay? And so another measure is citation rates. And that's very interesting because it, it speaks to how much other scholars are reading and paying attention to your work. Of course, they may be citing you to criticize you, um, but in general, the criticisms don't last very long. But a meaningful, serious impact to the field does. Um, just to give you another measure of impact, um, many, many will look at decay rates of citation rates. So, you know, you publish a major paper, and maybe in the first year, it's cited 20 times. And in the second year, it's cited 15 times. And in the third year, two times. And by the fourth year, none. So that's a paper that went away pretty quickly. And then there are other papers that 30 years later are still being cited. OK? And that's one thing that the, that the world of systematics and taxonomy speaks about, that those taxonomic papers don't get many citations. In some senses, they last forever. Because we're still citing species descriptions that were written 100 years ago, right? So, um, so we can look at impact factor. We can look at citations. We can look at citation decay rates. There's a whole field called bibliometry, where they're essentially measuring characteristics of, of the, the, the bibliographic world. Uh, but those are, those are some common ones in academia. OK? Other? Yep. Sorry, Alex. A quick one. Yeah. Obviously, there are things that you could present in the form of a figure as well as in a table. And even within a particular manuscript that you are preparing, <coughs> you might have multiple figures. Mm -hmm. What should what are your thoughts on selecting figures for inclusion in a manuscript besides color? Sure, 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 sure. So figure versus table. My personal view is that you use tables only when somebody needs the exact values of the numbers. So, you know, maybe we're talking about parameter settings for something complicated or, or um, numeric results that somebody will literally want to you know, copy or repeat verbatim. But most of those numbers are things where you're just looking for the pattern. You know, you're looking for the overall magnitude or the relative difference. And so in those cases, really much preferable is to turn it into a visual. Now, which visuals do you prioritize? For me, I'm always thinking about telling the story. So, you know, usually the limit is five figures in a paper, and it's usually considered a little bit much to go over that. So what I'm usually thinking about is to spend, this is very general, and it varies from paper to paper, but I'm often thinking about taking one figure to set the stage. You know, so for in this, in the case of these papers, maybe we're talking about a map of the country showing all of the occurrence points 
and you know the half degree grid, but just kind of setting up, this is the data set that I'm analyzing. And then three figures that really give the results, and then possibly one figure at the end that's in some sense interpreting or summarizing or um, generalizing the result. So there are no hard and fast rules, but I kind of like that where one of the figures really serves to, to set the stage. And one of the figures sets, uh, aims to sum up or synthesize. So, you know, obviously in some cases you need all five figures for the results. You know, so it varies. 